Hey everyone, National Master Sean Lei here. In today's chess video, we're going to be going over the much requested Knight C6 variation in the delayed Alapin. Let's get straight into it. Alright, let's get straight into it. Alright, so the Knight C6 variation, I'm just going to put it out there. Is not going to lead to as fun variations as the d6 variations that we saw before. It's going to be very rare that we win the opponent's queen, knight, or whatever piece early on. However, we do still have an advantage that our opponent is still probably not too accustomed to play against this. And so there are two main variations you should look out for. Every other variation, we'll look at, we'll look at those in a separate video, but those variations are just not good. Now, what are the two main variations? They are d5 and knight f6. And in this video, we'll be going over the, the d5 variations. So d5 variation is the old main line. That's what people used to play. And knight f6 is supposed to transpose into the regular Alapin. But I'll be teaching you guys a video, uh, um, a variation in the next episode in which we play d3. And it's going to be very similar to a Philidor-like structure. All right. So after pawn c3 and opponent plays pawn d5, what we're going to do is we're going to capture right away. The opponent's queen has to capture, otherwise, well, what else are they going to do? And we're going to play pawn d4. We're just going to strike out in the center and say to our opponent, hey, I'm going to capture you over here in the future when I have a bishop on e3. What you're going to do about that? And so our opponent has a couple responses here. Now, if they play something like really useless like knight f6, we can just play bishop e3. And if they fall for like e6, you just capture this pawn for free. They can't capture here because you can in between move their queen over here. When they capture back, you take their bishop and well, you're much better, right? This, some people have fallen for this in blitz. I don't expect too many people to fall for this in an actual game. Now, a strong chess player would probably just take on d4 because that creates an isolated pawn for white. And as you guys know, a an isolated pawn, especially an isolated queen pawn, is a long-term weakness. It can be easily attacked, and if you're not too careful, they can become a big weakness. However, isolated pawns in the center also could be your biggest strength. Why? Because you want to treat these isolated pawns as a battering ram. You want to basically use these to basically... See, uh, reap the like destruction in your opponent's position by pushing it off being annoying to the knight let's say your opponent plays knight f6 you even have possibilities to play like knight c3 say they move the queen back probably not there let's say queen over here you can already play d5 and it's kind of annoying for your opponent where does the knight go if they play here can you guys find a tactic here that wins the knight you can just play queen e4 check attacking the king attacking the knight the knight is lost and so that's what I mean by a battering ram. Now your opponent's move shouldn't be knight f6. They usually play one of two moves. One is much better than the other. Bishop g4 is the main line. And the idea is, hey, I'm going to capture a knight. If you capture back with a pawn, your d4 pawn is free. So it looks pretty bad. They have two attackers and our defender's gone. And even if we do defend it somehow like bishop b3, well, we get double pawns. That's no good, right? Well, bishop b2 is our savior move. Because the idea is if they capture here, we capture back. The queen cannot capture d4 because we have this very nice in-between bishop takes c6 check variation. And the opponent loses the queen. This happened in a couple blitz games, but again, your opponent should not be falling for this. So instead, what they might do is they might just play normally. They might play a move like knight f6, but now again, your knight c3 variation does come into play, in which you can play d5 immediately, play moves like queen a4, queen b3, attack these weaknesses on the queen side, and you're going to have a pretty decent game. Now, let's say they play e6, and they play knight c3. A lot of people like to play bishop b4, and after you castle, they just capture, capture, and they say, ha ha, I don't have to move my queen. But is the queen really that well, well placed over here? I don't know, not too sure. Don't really like it here. Because we can play moves like queen b3, rook b1, just basically gain a lot of compensation on the b file over here, right? Just attack this b file. What is our opponent going to do, right? What are they going to do? And it's really hard because if they play moves like pawn b6, well, this bishop isn't here to defend the light squares anymore, which means it's misplaced. His light square is going to be weak here. We can try to take advantage immediately. Uh, not now because our knight on f3 is hanging, but uh, potentially in the future, right? This bishop is misplaced because now he never wants to capture here because then we just have an amazing bishop. But if he doesn't capture us, what's this bishop's doing here? It's pinning for no reason, which means we have a good advantage in this position. So... This is another thing you want to um, make sure you know, 
And that's if your opponent just decides to play the silly castle and queen side move. I've seen a couple of this in real games as well. All you need to know is that your opponent's idea in these positions is that he's trying to play an early e5. And these e5 variations can be a little bit annoying. So what you're going to do is play bishop e3 to say I'm going to protect my d4 pawn. You're going to see this a lot, bishop e3 defending the d4 pawn. And if your opponent plays e5, that's a big mistake. Because now you can take here with your knight. And well, the bishop is hanging, so... Um, if they capture here, you can obviously capture back with the queen, and if they capture here, you capture back with the pawn, and the opponent's king is heavily exposed. If they go for something like this, well, you're completely fine again, because now you're even up a pawn here, your opponent's king is still completely exposed, and there's nothing to worry about there as well. And so after here, your opponent might play knight, at, knight f6, and this is the key move, just so you guys don't have to worry about e5 anymore, just play queen here. They can't capture here because after capture here, capture here, that would be mate on b7. And so the king castling on the queen side is just no good. You don't you, you don't need to be scared about the, those variations. Just remember to play queen b3 early attacking b7 and bishop e3 early to defend d4, and you'll be fine in most variations. And so that's what you do against bishop g4. It's rather simple to play as white. That's why um, I'm never too fearful whenever my opponent goes for these variations. Now the other variation is a bishop f5. This was a little bit trickier than it looks. Um, in this variation, most people, they seem to play bishop e3, I believe, after bishop e3. I, I've never really played against anybody who's done this, but you just take back with their rook, play e, they play e6, just play a3, again, you're fine. Bishop d3, castle king side, b4, b5, possibly. You can play bishop c2, queen d3. This opening, because you have the isolated queen pawn, which means you have more space in the center, which means you get to pick which side of the board you want to attack. If it's king side, go for the king side. If it's queen side, go for the queen side. The world is yours to command, right? And you'll be having a good time. And so that's bishop f5. Now, if your opponent plays any other variation here that's not moving the bishop out early, they're just going to have a bad bishop for the rest of the game. What do I mean? Let's say they play knight f6. Well, you can play knight c3 and play d5, but let's say they play e6, you can play knight c3. They move the queen, doesn't really matter where they move the queen. Um, you can play bishop d2 here, you can play bishop d3, you can play bishop b3. There's just so many things you can do here still. I like to just play bishop e2, keep it simple. Knight here, castle, knight's no longer pinned. And now you just play moves like d5 in the future, and you'll be completely fine in these variations. Um, one trick for you guys to know is if... if you're ever uncomfortable with your position and you think that um, your opponent's getting too close to the end game for comfort and you think your weakness is going to be here, you can always just sacrifice it and play for a lot of initiative and compensation in the center. Maybe not in this position in particular, but possibly you can do it when the opportunity presents itself. Definitely, that's possible. All right, so these are the basic lines after the D5 variation. I know it's not exciting, it's not as flashy, you don't get the, you know, 1-2 one, Wombo combo win the game, but it's definitely playable, and especially if your opponent doesn't know what they're doing, they could get into pretty uncomfortable positions like this one over here, and you can gain an advantage knowing that you know the opening better than your opponent. If you have any specific questions about any lines that you want to know in this variation, or in any other line, just tell me in the comments section below. I'll make sure to answer them um, quite um, as specific as possible, and I'll see you in the next video. Make sure to like and subscribe. Bye.